Hey everybody, um, this is our last screencast for China and it's just going to be a short one because we only have two slides to go. Um, we've been talking a lot about Deng's you know, changes to the economy and that conversion from a command economy to a, for all intents and purposes, a socialist market economy, uh, where there's all kinds of infusion of capitalism into China's economy. There are going to be many effects from Deng's reforms. For one thing, um, you're going to see basically a consumer revolution. I mean, remember, people didn't get choices of products and have opportunities to purchase all these things. They didn't have any discretionary income. So the fact that they infuse all this capitalism, thank you, dang, means that they're going to have the emergence of a new middle class, which is what typically happens with this kind of a uh, an economy, with a capitalist economy. Um, and, and it means a whole bunch of things that typically happen when countries industrialize and establish a capitalist economy. So you're going to see a lot of migrations of workers to the cities. This is going to be a floating population, though, because remember, because of the hukou system, migrant workers are going to have to go back to their hometowns for things like health care and their kids' educations and things of that sort. So um, it's going to be, you know, seasonal, if you will. Like everybody goes home for the Chinese New Year in January and so forth. Um, you're going to see things like unemployment because of capitalism. You're going to see inequality. Some are going to be amazingly successful with their new businesses. Hence, 93 billionaires in the National People's Congress. You're going to see things like crime and drugs and pollution with more people moving to the cities. I mean, these are the things that you would ordinarily expect. You're also going to see the breaking of the iron rice bowl. And again, what this means is you're changing all the welfare benefits and policies that you had under a command economy. And now it's every man, woman, child for him or herself. So the iron rice bowl is a thing of the past. Corruption. You've got a lot of people who are now, you know, being, you know, who have opportunities and they're making a lot of money. This is going to create a level of corruption. That's one reason why President Xi has made as one of his four comprehensives to crack down on corruption. It doesn't send the right message to the bulk of the population in China who haven't been able to benefit from this new kind of economy. And what they don't want more than anything is disruption to the status quo. Now, you can see why this is going to perpetuate that urban versus rural cleavage. It's much more pronounced once Deng comes along than it was under Mao. When you have a command economy and everyone is virtually given the same kinds of things and the disparity of wealth is not so great, your Gini index is much, much lower, you're going to have less unrest. But as things progress, you are going to see, the rural people are going to say, this doesn't make sense here. We are tied to our hometowns in rural areas when all the opportunity is happening in the urban areas. The better health care, the better education, the more job opportunities, and you name it. So, um, you know, the, a current statistic is that only 10% of rural youths even go to high school. This does not allow them many job opportunities. So I, I think that just has to be taken into account when you look at that urban versus rural cleavage. All right, and more recent reforms. Uh, Huko reforms. So with all of the recent development, it is not surprising that the HUCO has been relaxed. So residency requirements, they do allow you to move to certain cities. You still cannot move wherever you want. We can't, uh, you're not going to be able to move to the, the really big, big cities of, of 10 million or more, the Shanghais, the Beijings, the Guangzhou's, Nanjing, et cetera. These are large, large cities that are already overpopulated and they're not going to allow they're not going to relax your residency requirements so you can go there. But the Chinese government has realized it's got to be more flexible if they want to continue this economic development, continue to be a leader in the world's, uh, uh, in the, in, you know, in the global economy. 
All right, other recent rural reforms. Things like the local village elections that we talked about. You know, there's so much unrest in the in the village areas, letting them choose a representative, even if it's out of hand picked five or six, makes them feel better. New agricultural or rural land policies. I mean, these, you know, this whole idea that you can, um, you know, buy up the right to use other people's land um, allows you know, more corporate farmers, people who are in farming in the rural areas to make a better income for themselves. And that property law of 2007, super instrumental in that. Anti-poverty programs. I mean, these are just things that the Chinese government is trying to do to ameliorate the effect of that rich poor divide. Uh, improved compulsory education. So it's not optional in the rural areas to get educated or not. They're giving, they're sending better teachers out that way. They're trying to, you know, give high school students at least the tools that they need so that they can get jobs later. Uh, infrastructure development. They're purposefully pouring money into rural areas to make them more desirable so that not everybody feels like they have to rush to the cities. These are just a handful of some of the recent reforms. And there are many more, I am sure. But, and we talked before too about how the judiciary has had to keep up with, you know, all of these new economic developments. China's judicial system was not prepared for that. So if they want to continue to attract foreign money, if they want to continue to have things run smoothly at home, then their judicial system has to keep up with all of that. All right, you guys, that's it for China. Um, I hope that you stay healthy and stay well. Look for further information with regard to testing and how that's all going to work if we are not, in fact, back at school in 10 days. I just don't know what's going to happen, and we'll go from there. All right. Take care, everybody.